Hey, this is Michael Carter, lead pastor here at The Life Church, and I just want to thank you for watching this rebroadcast of this week's message. We hope it's in some way an inspiration to you and that there will be things that you can apply to your own life to help you along your journey. I'm really glad that you're wanting to grow in your relationship with Jesus, and I believe the Word of God will help you do just that. So be encouraged, and if there's something in the message that helps you or rings true with you, we'd like you to respond. You can leave a question or a comment or even a prayer request in the comments below. I'm praying for you, and I hope you have an amazing week. Hope of the cross, hope of the cross for today. Hope of the cross for today. And we're going to continue in this, this message series on the cross. And last week, we emphasized the centrality of the cross and how the cross should be central in our lives. Everything uh, should go back to and start from the cross in our life. We talked about the importance of the cross being central and how it's necessary for a follower of Christ to make the cross central in your life in order to fully understand the transformative power of the cross. Yes, it happened more than 2,000 years ago, and it's easy to uh, forget about it. It's easy to for it to become even a cliche, something as great as the cross. It becomes cliche to us, but we need to understand that there is a surpassing greatness. There is a surpassing power. There is an authority that the cross and Jesus' work on the cross gives to us. He did it once, but it was for all time. God is never going to take that power back. And so today, I just want to, for a few moments, dive in a little further to explore this surpassing greatness and power and authority that the cross gives to us so that we can properly respond by praising God for what? Defeating Satan. You know, I think for, for us who have been in church for a while, for us who go to church, uh, you know, regularly, uh, we, 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 we say things like, you know, praise God, praise God for what? Praise God because he's good. Praise God. And, and we have these reasons. And I think that sometimes we lose sight of the fact that it's not just a cliche when we say praise God. What are you praising God for? There are some real tangible things that God has done for us and through us that we should be praising God for. And so my aim today is to get you and I to understand the power and the authority of the cross so that you can enjoy the inheritance. Come on, somebody. The inheritance in Christ. And I'm hoping uh, to explain why the power and the authority of the cross enables you to enjoy that inheritance. So I want to kind of dive into that. I mean, I think that it's unfortunate that so many Christians go to church every Sunday, go to a Bible study during the week, maybe on a Wednesday or some day during the week, or attend a small group. And it's just, like I say, it just becomes a cliche, and we still function without understanding fully the rights and privileges and authority that we have in Christ. We do it as something to check off on a box. We went to church that day, so it makes us feel better. But we have to understand that the cross is not just something that makes us feel better. It's the beginning of a relationship. Salvation is the beginning of a relationship. The gospel is not just the good news of the death of Christ. It's the good news of the kingdom of God that his resurrection provided for us. There are things that we ought to be praising God for, not just so we can say, praise God. Come on, somebody. What the cross provided to you and me is the opportunity to see what God can do beyond the normal everyday routine of life. The cross is the key to God invading the difficult and mundane circumstances of life. Come on. Just as God invaded the tomb of Jesus, come on, after he died on the cross, flipping things around, come on, in order to reveal his power and authority. And guess what? He shares that power and authority with us. Come on. A lot of Christians sing about God's power. A lot of Christians talk about God's power, but can never 
testify to experiencing God's power since they have never accessed God's power. They have never seen him turn and twist and tweak things beyond human comprehension. They've never seen when they're in a midnight hour, most of us have been in a midnight hour, but we've not seen God come in a midnight hour and turn things around in our life at the last moment when there was no hope. Most of us have never understood that if we believe in our heart and speak with our mouth, just as we did for salvation, the name of Jesus in our circumstances, our circumstances don't have a choice but to change. Come on, somebody. We don't understand that. And so we want to talk about that a little bit today. This this passage that we're going to read, if you just be patient with me for a moment, we're going to read a long passage of Scripture. And I usually would like to say, well, I apologize. You know, it's it's just such a long passage of Scripture. But you know what? I just decided I'm not going to apologize for reading the Word. Because if, because if I could preach to you all day long or teach to you all day long, but it's all about the Word of God. If we don't do anything but read the Word of God, come on somebody, then we've done something. Ephesians chapter 1, I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible this, uh, in this particular series. Uh, but if you have the King James Version, the old, old school, that's all right. Nothing Old school is not a negative connotation. Uh, you know, I say that now that I'm old. Old school's not negative. Old school's good. Just sometimes we need to be old school. Everybody trying something new, and the old school works. Come on. If you're old school with King James, that's all right. New King James, like I mostly do, that's good, too. If you're NIV, hey, that's all right as well. You know, you can be GNT, GT, GW, whatever. Message version, American Standard, whatever. And we get there together. We got the same Holy Spirit, same Jesus died on the cross. I'm reading from the New American Standard, and starting at verse 3, Paul tells the church at Ephesus, Timothy, the pastor there, and the church at Ephesus, he tells them this. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places, comma. Now listen, I just want to tell you, I know, I said I have a long passage to read, but I'm sorry. If 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 that was the only thing in the Bible... Oh, my goodness. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. I know that was a little test. He was trying to test me there. Of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has, past tense, who has blessed us in Christ with every. How many is every? That's all of them. With every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, before you had an opportunity to sin, before you had an opportunity to praise him, before you had an opportunity to do anything, he already chose you before the foundation of the world that we should be holy, that means set apart, blameless, that means blameless, you can't be blamed, come on, before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. You know, one of the things that uh, I, (laughs) one of the things that always gets me as, you know, I ask my kids sometimes, you know, why did you do that? Why do you do those things? Why did you say that? And they say, because I wanted to. They don't really have an explanation just because I wanted to. Well, this is the first time that that is a good explanation. God did something he could say, because I wanted to. According to his will, because I wanted to, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him, we have redemption. That means that he bought us back through his blood. He bought us back. He bought us back. He bought us back through his blood. The forgiveness of our trespasses. Let me talk about that just for a moment. I know some of you is getting on your nerves because you're just like, well, just read it and then talk about it. But I, I can't. I can't get through it because these things. The whole, thank you, Holy Spirit. Trespass. He forgave us of our trespasses. You know what a trespass is. You've seen those signs. Well, some of you may not have, you know, maybe the younger people. Uh, but I know when I was young, we used to, you know, me and my partner, we used to go around the neighborhood and we'd cut grass, you know, for 10 bucks or 20 bucks but then some people's yard they would have a sign that says you know keep off the grass or no trespassing right you've seen that before no trespassing that means don't come on this land because it doesn't belong to you 
When you step over here, you're on a place that does, you're on private property, you're on, a, you're on a lawn, you're on some place that doesn't belong to you. That's what trespassing means. Now watch this. When we trespass, what do you think that means? All we think of is sin. He forgives us of our sin. But trespass means that you're stepping onto a place that doesn't belong to you. I wish I could get you to see as a Christian that when you sin, when you step over the line, what you're really doing is stepping into a place that doesn't belong to you. That's not who you are. You're holy and blameless. But the enemy would get us to think, well, look at you. See how you sinned again. Just walk around with your head down. You are no good. You're not worthy. You're not this or that. And God is trying to tell you, yes, you are worthy. What you did was you trespassed. Now come back to where you belong. Stop stepping over there where you don't belong. Don't let the enemy entice you into trespassing into a place you don't belong. Act like who you are. You don't have to become someone else. God has already, if you have, if you believe in your heart, the Lord Jesus is the Messiah, and you've confessed with your mouth that God raised him from the dead on the third day, then you are saved, and he sealed you with his spirit. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new, and he has made you a new person. So then, if you go back and trespass, that's why he uses it, trespass that means you're stepping into something that doesn't belong to you come back into the place that belongs to you oh i wish i could get us to see that this morning because we think that's who we are when you sin when you fall short you think that the devil would get you to to think that's who i am i'm just the one who messes up all the time i wish i could be like clint because he doesn't seem like he ever messes up kevin never messes up elder never messes up you know the girls from kentucky they don't mess up I mean, look, they're at church. They're here from Kentucky, and they came to church. Come on, I wish I could be like that. But God is telling you that I have made you holy and blameless. And yes, you stepped over the line, but get up, get up. Like he told the woman caught in adultery, look, where are your accusers? I have none, Lord, then I don't accuse you either. Now get up and stop sinning. Get up and be who you are. Stop trespassing. So he, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches. Man, I'm only halfway through. Okay, according, this is only just the scripture. But don't worry, it ain't going to be long. I know y'all getting hungry. Don't worry about it. According to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us, in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, his purpose, because I wanted to, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things, how many things? All things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. Watch this. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your, the good news of your salvation, and believed him, there's the key word right there, believed him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. Now, yes, there is an infilling of the Holy Spirit. Uh, the, the, the disciples, the apostles, when they were uh, on the day of Pentecost, they were filled with the Spirit and they you know, spoke in other tongues and, and those things. But you, when you believe in Christ, when you, when you confess with your mouth, you're sealed with the Holy Spirit. Why? Because he is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his his glory. Paul says, for this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks. I do not cease <laughs> to give thanks thanks. I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers that the, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. Having the eyes of your heart enlightened, open the eyes of my heart, Lord, having the eyes of your heart enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. 
What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his great might? Now that is a mouthful that Paul said. There's a lot of study that can go into those verses right there that you, a lot of nuggets you can pull out. But what Paul is trying to tell us is that you have an inheritance and it's according to his will. It's not because of anything that you've done. You don't get the name, the family name, because of something you've done. You're born into it. You are born into it. God wants you to know this morning that you're born into it. You can't do anything to get it. Therefore, you can't do anything to lose it. Just repent. Come back. The prodigal son had the same place. He had the same place in the family. All he had to do was come back. Now, if you don't come back, that's on you. But your place is still here. Come to yourself. Get up. Come back. Stop trespassing with those pigs. Come on back. Come on back. Come on back. And the enemy is going to do everything he can to keep us from realizing this. Have you ever watched one of those action adventure movies like Indiana Jones or you know I forget the one with uh, Angelina Jolie where she's you know looking for the what is it Tomb Raider yeah thank you very much Tomb Raider yeah and uh, you are or a movie one of those movies like that you know where the hero or heroine is you know is looking for uh, some artifact or treasure and then along the way what really makes the movie right is along the way he or she faces opposition coming from the enemy and just when you think that person is there something else comes and then thing blows up and then they got to do some more things just to just to get to where they want to get to uh, to get to that prize and these these kind of films often remind me of what Satan attempts to do in our lives and in the lives of believers as we move toward our inheritance and as we move toward the understanding the revelation that we are that we are free from the curse of the law the understanding that we are blessed and highly favored and all of those things as we move toward these things the enemy is going to throw everything in our path to get us off of the path that we're going he does that he does that but Paul gives us some insights into the benefits and the authority that the treasure of the cross has to offer when he writes here to the church at Ephesus. And I really believe that sometimes we keep falling into the same thing because of an identity issue. We don't realize who we are, what we have in Christ. And so because of that, we just keep doing the same thing over and over. But once you realize who you are and what you have, then you say, oh, well, hang on a second. I, I didn't know. The whole time I could have been doing this, it's kind of like that story. You know, we've told it here several, several times, but it, but it bears repeating again. It's like that, you know, that, old, that, that illustration of the man who uh, won a ticket. He was, he was poor. He didn't have any money, but he won a, a ticket on a cruise. Remember that? Some of y'all remember this story? He won a ticket somebody you know in the in the in the mail he somehow he won a ticket on a cruise and he thought well I'm gonna go on this cruise but I really don't have any money but well at least it's something to do and I you know I can get on the cruise for free so he went and he made his way there and he got on the cruise ship and he just stayed in his room the you know the whole four days and five nights he he just stayed in there five days and four nights I guess he just stayed in his room because he didn't have any money to go out and do anything else. But at least he got away from home because of the free ticket. And then when he was getting off the cruise ship, the captain was greeting everybody as they were leaving. You know, thank you for cruising with us. Thank you for cruising with us. And then the man came down the steps and he said, oh, I didn't I didn't I never saw you on the cruise ship. Were you even on this cruise? I didn't see you. And he said, yes, you know, I just I stayed in my room because I, I didn't you know, I didn't have any. I won this piece ticket this ticket and I really didn't have any money to do anything and the captain said oh you didn't know the ticket covers everything once you got the ticket you got everything it's all inclusive you could have swam in the pool you could have eaten 24 hours which is good for some but not for me you know we're having pizza at midnight I've done that and uh, you know everything but he didn't know what do you think he would have done if he would have known 
If he would have known, he would have taken advantage of all of it. That's how we are as Christians sometimes. I believe that we just don't know. We don't have the revelation of what God has done for us and who we are in Christ and how we are overcomers. Not we're going to be overcomers, but he's already made us overcomers. How we are already more than conquerors. Not that we're going to one day become a more than conqueror, but you already are. And if you begin to know that in your spirit, you'll begin to walk in that come on somebody come on somebody there are benefits that the cross has given to us benefits that the cross has given to us first of all the cross displays God's surpassing greatness surpassing greatness surpassing means incomparable or outstanding you see Jesus was crucified and nailed to a cross most people would say on Friday, I don't want to cause no theology problems. I, I kind of disagree with that, but that's all right. It's okay. I don't want to argue about that, but whatever. Jesus was nailed to the cross on a day, and uh, it was a bad day. It was a bad day physically because he was beaten to a pulp. We know that. You know, it was, it was a bad day uh, emotionally. Scripture says that he cried tears of blood, right? And it was a bad day spiritually. He was separated from God the Father on that day, right? And he, he was separated from God. But that day, whether it's Friday or whatever day it was, that day did not define where he would end up. Come on. It didn't define where he, would, where he wound up being. Because on Sunday, come on, God reversed the effects of Friday, raising Christ from the dead and seating him in the heavenlies. I don't care where you are today or what you are going through. The place you are today doesn't determine your destiny. The place you are today simply tells you where you start. Where you are today is only, all it does is tell you, well, this is where I'm starting from. No matter how far you're back, no matter how much you weigh, it just tells you where you're starting from. That's all it tells you. So we have to believe in the greatness of God's power. Come on. The resurrection of Christ demonstrates God's power. If we would have kept reading there in verses 19, 20, and 21, it talks about that, how, how the resurrection demonstrates the power of God. We would have never known the power that God has truly unless we wouldn't have seen it. Unless we would have seen, we wouldn't have seen and known and heard that Jesus died, not just died in a car accident or died from an aneurysm, but he died a bloody death on a cross because he had the sins of everyone who had ever lived and everyone who will ever live. Come on, people who aren't born yet, he died on the cross for their sin. All of that sin was on his shoulders. But guess what? What's most important here today is that your sin, your sin was on his shoulders. Every trespass, every transgression was on his shoulders at Calvary on the cross. And it's wiped away. It's wiped away. The Father sees you through the blood of Christ. That's what Jesus was representing, even though he hadn't died on the cross yet. It was a foreshadowing with the woman caught in adulter adultery when he said, where are your accusers? There are none, Lord. Then neither do I accuse you. How can the God of the universe say, I don't accuse you? He's the one that came up with the law. It was his law that said, don't commit adultery. And it's not like he heard that this woman, she was caught in adultery. And he said, I don't accuse you. Imagine that. Somebody needs to hear that today. God is telling you, I don't accuse you. Now get up and sin no more. Get up and sin no more. But guess what? I don't accuse you. Your sins are wiped away. Your transgressions, your trespasses are wiped away. Start acting like who you are. Just simply start acting like who I've already made you to be and stop trespassing. We need to believe that God provides that same power to you. God's power that raised Christ from the dead is also available to you. God has enough power to turn even the worst scenario 
in, in your life into a victory. And not only that, not only that, it's not that God, uh, you know, is, is facetious and he just wants to get you in bad situations all the time. But I believe that God loves it. it if you find yourself in a bad situation, he loves to come in when you speak the name of Jesus and say in Jesus name. He loves to say, yep, that's all I was waiting for. Come on. Here comes the power. Watch what I can do. The midnight hour. That's why Paul said, and at midnight, and at midnight, come on, they prayed and sang praises unto God. And as they did, a great earthquake, and everyone's bands were loosed. Come on, somebody. They were free. God loves that. He loves to do it. If you found yourself in a midnight hour, guess what? It's a perfect opportunity to speak the name of Jesus, to speak the word of God, and see the greatness of God. The cross also demonstrates Christ's authority. Again, as I, I probably say every other week, you know, I just, I, I, I love sports, and so, you know, a lot of these illustrations are sports illustrations, but if you notice, you know, when you watch, especially, my favorite is football, but, you know, any sport, but especially like football, men's football, because, you know, those guys are big. I mean, most of those guys are like huge, you know, 300-pound guys, 250-pound guys, and it's their job to hit. So, you know, it's like that's what their job is to hit each other. And it's, you know, football is not a contact sport. It really is a collision sport, right? They collide with each other. And so one of the things that I, I think about is the referees. I look at the referees in football, and, you know, they're not the strongest men on the football field. In fact, most of the time they're older. Come on, slower, heavier, right? Yet, when a referee throws a yellow flag on a player who is much bigger than him, the bigger player has to yield. He might grumble, he might complain a little bit, but he has to yield. The faster player has to slow down. The stronger player has to do what he says. This is because the referee has a greater power than just power. He has something called authority. Authority. Authority overrules power. So we have to believe that Jesus has supreme authority. His ascension placed him above all rule and authority. He disarmed sin's power over you. Jesus sits far, far above any situation that you're dealing with. And not only that, he imparts authority to you. See, power, it's one thing to have power. It's another thing to have authority. Come on. Why? Because authority is the right to use the power that you have. See, you can have power. You can have power to do something. But if you don't have the authority to do it, you don't have the right to do it. But Christ has given you the authority to use his name. In the name of Jesus, we have the victory. In the name of Jesus, I am an overcomer. In the name of Jesus, everything that I need is provided for. In the name of Jesus, I am more than a conqueror. In the name of Jesus, there is power and authority. There is no name in heaven, on earth, or below it that is greater than the name of Jesus. And the question becomes, why don't we use the name of Jesus? We got to believe it. We have to believe that Jesus' authority rules over Satan in your life. Come on. Although Satan is more powerful than you, he can't touch the authority of God. Jesus disarmed him. We have to understand and believe that the cross's authority and power is accessed through communion. We're going to take communion next week, but I just wanted to touch on it very briefly because one of the things, this is, of course, comes from the Last Supper, and Jesus said, as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. And so this is why I say we, we need to be reminded, and that's why we take communion, whether you come from a church that does it every week or once a month or once a quarter. We, we, as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. He broke the bread, and he said, this is my body that is broken for you. He, he, he poured out the wine. This is my blood that is shed for you. What is it a reminder of? Yeah, it's a reminder of a time that he went to the cross, but it's also a reminder of the power and authority that came from him going to the cross and taking your sins to the cross. 
We proclaim the Lord's death by taking communion. Eating the bread and drinking the cup proclaims his death, it says in 1 Corinthians. But when you take communion, you're proclaiming and preaching to the evil principalities that Christ defeated Satan. You remember that time when Jesus died? Remember that time when you, you thought you had won? Remember that time when you was laughing and you were happy because he went to the grave? You remember that time? Oh, do you remember that time three days later? Do you remember that time when he got up from the grave? Do you remember that time he walked the earth for 40 days teaching about the kingdom of God, walking through walls and revealing himself to people on the road to Emmaus? You remember that time when he stood on the mountain and he said, all authority is given to me in heaven and in earth. And then he ascended into heaven to be at the right hand of the father. But he left the body of Christ here. You are the body. So the authority is with the head and the body. You are the authority that's on the earth. Next, the cross gives us reason for praise. Praise God for his authority. God is seated high above all rule and all authority. And because of our relationship with him, we are seated with him and have access to his rule and his authority in our life. Because of our relationship, really that's what we want to get to. This is all about relationship. That's why I don't want you to come to church just to check off a box and say, I went to church. I went to church. There will be enough people that will do that on Easter. And that's okay. That's okay. But we want, to get, we want to get into their spirit, into your spirit, into my spirit. That this, The whole thing is about relationship. And that's what everything is about. The law, everything. Principles, discipleship, all that we do, the Holy Spirit. Everything that we do, singing, worship, all of it is about a relationship with God. That's what he wants. If there's no relationship, forget about the rest. That's what he wants is a relationship with you. And if you know the who behind the name, come on, somebody. And then finally, the cross provides victory over your enemies. Believe that this morning. Believe that you are spiritually seated in heaven. Ephesians 2 verse 5 talks about how God seated us with him in heavenly places. And so you must understand where you are seated and what that means and how that provides access to Christ's authority. Believe that you, your spiritual inheritance uh, affects your physical reality. I'm going to say that again. Believe that your spiritual inheritance affects your physical reality. You have the authority to use the name of Jesus. Not everybody does. That's why the, the, the Simon in the Bible who was trying to, uh, to, to use the name of Jesus and the demon said, well, Paul, I know. Jesus, I know. Who you be? Who is you? You might be saying Jesus, but I don't know you because you don't know Jesus. But guess what? You do. You do. You know Jesus, and so you have the authority to use his name. There are certain advantages that come from being a platinum flyer. I've had, a, I've had a, an opportunity to, to fly often, like some of you. And being a platinum flyer, when you accrue a, a large number of miles with an airline company, they, they, you know, they, they, they send you, uh, you know, information on all the benefits that you have. And you have significant opportunities that you can take advantage of. There may be upgrade options, booking options, priority, access, some of you know this, options and other benefits. But in order to use them, you must know the privileges of what your platinum level relationship with the airline company affords you. Failure to understand your inheritance of benefits results in not enjoying significant opportunities available to you to enjoy. And unlike God, guess what? The airline company is not necessarily going to tell you all the benefits. It's on the website. Uh, we sent you an email, that one long email that you said you read a few lines of and deleted. It was all in there. I can't help it. Well, can I go back? Nope. You had to take advantage of you had to take the advantage advantage of the opportunity of a lifetime in the lifetime of the opportunity. That lifetime is gone now. You should have read the email. That's the way they do you. Many Christians also fail to know the rights and privileges that the cross has afforded them. Come on. They fail to utilize the benefits that God has ordained for you and I, his saints. 
Folks, he has given us, he has given us rights and authority and benefits that we don't use. All we do is we, we say that's the way the cookie crumbles, that's the way the ball bounces, that's what life has thrown at me. And God is saying, guess what? You have an authority to overrule all of that. And I want to tell you this morning, friend, whatever it is that you're dealing with or whomever it is that you're dealing with, they don't have the last say in your life. They don't have the last say in your life. No matter how big, no matter uh, how, how tall, no matter how wide, no matter how deep it goes. I don't care if you dug your own self a hole. Come on, I, now there's consequences for what we do. But I don't care if you dug your own self a hole. It's not the last word in your life. The word of God should be the last word in your life. Come on. The word of God. He's positioned higher than all rule, authority, dominion, and power. Authority, dominion, and power. 